Namaskar. Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I am your host Sri Ayer. Today I have back with me two board members from Kona, Suresh Krishnamurthy and Sudha Jagannathan ji. So let's first welcome them and then we will talk about what we are going to be discussing today. Sudha ji, Namaskar, Jai Sri Ram and Suresh ji, Namaskar, Jai Sri Ram. Namaskar, Jai Sri Ram. Namaskar and Jai Sri Ram. So, um, Sudhaji, you've been on our channel and Suresh ji, you've also been on our channel, but I've had you under different uh, occasions before. But we are back to talking about Equality Labs. And more importantly, there is a seminar, I should say webinar in Stanford on the 6th of February and looks like having lost out getting the SB 403 passed as law or passed into law, um, the e EL sponsored Lumpens are trying to do something else, trying to go back to the university, see if they can create a ruckus and so on and so forth. So viewers, today, Suresh Krishnamurti has a slide deck in which he's going to present to us what EL is about, who are funding this. I have done a preliminary deck once, Suresh, but it's not in the same depth as what you have unearthed. So I'm sure people will find this thing very revealing. So I'm going to yield the floor to you, Suresh, open, opening comments. And then I will let Sudhaji come in with opening comments. And then let's get back to you and do the slides. Go Perfect. Uh, namaskar. Namaskar, everybody. Um, and as always, uh, Sri Ayewal, I really thank you for the opportunity. This is a fantastic forum. Uh, and, and we really hope to reach a broad audience with this. Uh, it's kind of timely and it is important. So. Everybody knows the whole caste jamela that happened last year with uh, uh, with Aisha Wahab and SB 403. Uh, Sudha Jagannathan, who's a fellow board member of Kona, has been she was she was intimately involved in that whole process. But during that entire process, we asked ourselves a very fundamental question: Who exactly does Equality Labs represent? I mean, to hear the public statements, you would think that they were a, some kind of an advocacy nonprofit organization standing up for Dalits everywhere and, and for oppressed Dalits and champions. But as we moved through the as we moved through the process, we realized there were many Dalit groups that stepped up and said, no, they don't speak for us. This is not our experience. And of course, as the Casca, the Cisco case has practically fallen apart, um, we know that this this whole idea that somehow there is this rampant uh, discrimination against Dalits is, is kind of bogus. So I want to turn it over to Sudhaji, Sudha, Sudha Jagannathan, who is a board member of uh, Kona, and to talk about her own her thoughts on this, because she raised this with that for the first time. That like, who are these people really representing? So Sudha, Sudhaji, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sriji, again, for hosting us. You know, I mean, uh, I want to say, if you look at my name, it says Kona board member, Wahujan. Let me tell you, that is an ID. I, will, I feel like it's been forced on me. It was not part of my life for 40 years in the US. And even before that, in, the, in India, uh, it was not a big deal for me personally. I'm not speaking for all Indians, uh, but in the United States, it's never been an issue. And I decided to pick that up uh, because that is what I am. All right. And um, I, uh, it's sort of become incumbent on the Dalit and the Bahujan in the United States now to stand up and say, hey, we are the legitimate <laughs> Dalit and Bahujan. Somebody else is coming to uh, claim uh, our identities and co-opt it and uh, stand uh, to champion for us, even though nobody asks um, Equality Labs to champion our causes. And um, so we have to take back. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that I'm very happy to be on the Kona um, team because we have Dalit and Bahujan as leaders. And we stand up as Dalit and Bahujan. And it's nothing to be ashamed of because it's part of who we are, right? But uh, we just do not want others who have no reason to uh, take those identities and say that, claim that they are standing for the oppressed Dalit and Bahujan. Honestly, I don't know who's an oppressed and Dalit Bahujan in United States. We did not come here with a begging bowl. We came here because we are qualified to be here. And I, I would say, I think maybe it's a big, relief to a lot of Indians that we can come here, be who we are, and be represented for the skills and capabilities we bring here. One thing I would remind is what um, President John Kennedy said, don't, don't ask what the country can do for you, but what can you do for the country? So when we come here, 
we are always thinking about what can I do for this country? This is my new homeland. I have all of these wonderful skills and I would like to put that <laughs> to work uh, to, for the benefit of myself and the entire nation. But people like Equality Labs is all about what can the country give me, right? I mean, the speakers on uh, the Stanford, you look at them, they're all uh, claiming victimhood to get something. So I just want to preface it by saying this has been forced on us, but we are proudly standing up and taking them on. Thank you so much, Sudhaji. Thank you so much, Suresh And Now I'm going to uh, put up the slide deck and over to you, Suresh Ji. Thank you. So as Sudhaji pointed out, let's go to the first one. So as Sudhaji pointed out, we were asking, we were basically asking the question, okay, if Equality Labs is really not representing what I would call mainstream Dalits in the United States. What exactly is their agenda? Who are they coming from? And we thought it'd be useful to start from where Equality Lab started as an organization. Who funded it? Where did it go? Now, the general impression people have, of course, is Equality Labs is this nonprofit, charitable organization, advocacy. If you ask 10 people out of 10, I would say, would, are, would come back and say, oh, of course they are a nonprofit organization. Of course they are you know, an advocacy group championing the rights of Dalits. So we decided to take a look because the one thing that I could not find was any mention of Equality Labs in the Internal Revenue Systems database of charitable organizations. Now that is the gold standard for anybody who's been recognized as a 501c3 charity. They will be you know, recognized by the IRS, obviously, and it's their documents are publicly available and as is ours and, and as is everybody else. So we started looking and we didn't find Equality Labs anywhere in the 501c3 list. So we kind of scratched our heads and said, okay, where are these guys coming from? So if you can go to the first slide. Now you live in the Silicon Valley, so you are aware of, uh, <clears throat> you are aware of uh, uh, the, the pitch books that, that, are, that are made. And we found a curious reference to Equality Labs in a pitch book which kind of piqued my attention because I, I'm in the financial space as well. And it turns out there are three primary investors who started Equality Labs. So the first one is New Media Ventures, which is an angel group. Then there is San Francisco Foundation, which is tagged as a limited partner, and the North Start Fund. I, I, I don't know if this is a typo, and they actually meant North Star Fund, or if there is actually a fund called North Start Fund. So. We'll I was wondering about that too. Yeah. Yeah, I was kind of scratching my head, going, "Is this a typo in pitch book? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe." Uh, so, New Media Ventures. New Media Ventures is it's a venture capital angel group, venture capital firm. Uh, it's a venture capital uh, undertaking. It is wholly owned by the Tides Foundation, and the Tides Foundation is uh, extensively supported by the Omedia Network (ON), as they are called. This information is public. You can go look it up, and and it's right there. And the and Omedia Network, of course, is known for uh, Omedia. Well, Pierre Omedia was the founder of eBay and a multi-billionaire, and he has his interests much like Soros has his interests, and so on and so forth. And if you look at the uh, the pages for New Media Ventures, they're basically saying, you know, we are advocating for change. The usual the usual language, you know, repressed people, yada yada yada. But it's a venture capital, which means they are looking for return on investment. If you go through their web pages, they tell you how to get a good return on your investment. So the, the, the ventures that they are backing are not necessarily 513Cs. They don't behave like 501C3s, and they are profit-making ventures. So that's the first, what I would call, I don't want to say it a red flag, but that's the first flag that tells us that Equality Labs is not what it immediately seems to be. So then we looked at the San Francisco Foundation and, and then it started getting really interesting. Now the San Francisco Foundation is a, has been around for more than a couple of decades. They, they have a budget of about like 200 or $250 million a year. They are huge, right? And you can imagine, we were kind of scratching our heads going, okay, why are they a limited partner in a venture when they are essentially a charity? Is this how they're being characterized? So if you look at, if we found that in the 2000, in their 2016 filing, we found a curious reference 
to a donation to a, to, a, uh, to an entity called Fractured Atlas. Uh, Fractured Atlas, which is tagged as a 501c3 in their uh, uh, in their uh, form I-990, I mean, on their um, uh, 990 form. And the amount was $37,500. Now, Fractured Atlas immediately rang a bell because we know, having looked at Equality Labs, that Equality Labs is funded through Fractured Atlas. And, and I'll kind of come to that in a minute. So this was the first trigger for us. It was like, wait a minute. So San Francisco Foundation gave $37,500 to a 501c3, but they're also listed as a limited partner on a venture cab, on a venture, on a, on a pitch book. So you start to wonder, you start to kind of scratch your head and go, okay, what is really going on here? So then we said, okay, let's take a closer look at San Francisco Foundation and see what they have done. So if we switch to the next slide, so we looked at the next years, right? So in the 2018 San Francisco Foundation, we found a direct reference to Equality Labs, but this time as a project of something called Creative Catalysts. So here is the first, what I would call screen, right? Which hides Equality Labs from what it really is. So Equality Labs at this point in 2018, at least, is supposedly a project of a not-for-profit. Okay, not-for-profits do have projects and they do execute on things like that. Uh, um, Creative Catalyst has been tagged as a 51C3. They have an IRS number, 46480742. Everything looked legit above board. We noticed a couple of keywords. Uh, as I've highlighted there, the amount given was $124,000, which now we have gone from 36,000 to 125, almost a, you know, <clears throat> a significant, almost a four times jump. And this time it says to strengthen and scale digital security resilience and digital harassment. And again, these are trigger words for us because as we look at it, uh, Equality Labs has been positioning itself as a entity that provides digital cybersecurity for harassed groups on how to protect themselves from being doxxed and so on and so forth. Now, remember, we are talking about an organization that on its website claims that its primary purpose is to fight for caste oppressed people. And here they are describing themselves as providing cybersecurity services. We have gone from advocacy directly to revenue, right? Now, whether they do it for free or whether they charge their, their customers, we don't know. And, and I'll get to why we don't know in a second. But so by 2018, we are looking at Equality Labs as a project of Creative Catalyst. Um, and it seems like they have kind of put one corporate veil in front of them in the form of Creative Catalyst. So if you could if you could switch to the next one. Now, then we looked at 2019. The San Francisco Foundation continues to fund them, this time to Fractured Atlas, right? But now it gets interesting. They paid $35,000, they gave $35,000 to Fractured Atlas. Again, the same, uh, we have a IRS uh, employee identification number, again, tagged as a 51C3. And as the buried in the description, on the right-hand side, you'll see that whole medley of stuff buried in the description is a tiny reference to creative catalysts, right? Now you've got a second veil. So Equality creative Labs catalyst, was originally- Creative Catalyst, go ahead. Yeah, right? So first you had Equality Labs as a project of Creative Catalyst. Now you have Fractured Atlas funding Creative Catalyst, which presumably <laughs> is still funding Equality Labs, right? Now you had two corporate veils in front of Equality Labs, okay. and the keywords are still here, South Asian American, digital resilience, South Asian specific public health materials. And you now have a, a line at the bottom, women of color in the arts. Why is that important? Because one of the things that Equality Labs prides on its website is we, through an intersection of art and digital 
uh, uh, digital resiliency, right? So now we have a better picture of this organization called Equality Labs. First of all, it's venture funded, which means it's most likely for profit, right? It's not going to just disappear. Secondly, it seems to kind of morph depending on who is funding them. So when they go to San Francisco Foundation, they are digital security. I have uh, a report from another nonprofit based out of New York where they are protecting vulnerable women, right? Then you have a third situation where they are projecting themselves as championing South Asian art, right? So this is like, if I could make a Harry Potter reference, it's like the mirror of Erisette, right? Equality Labs is exactly what the grant making organization wants it to be. They morph themselves into whatever it is that they want to be, right? Sometimes they are doing digital resilience. Sometimes they're doing art. Sometimes they're doing championing uh, the cause of Dalits. Sometimes they are fighting for blacks. Sometimes they're fighting for Palestinians. It doesn't matter. Whoever they go in front of, they take on the form of whoever they want to be, like the mayor of Edison, right? So, then we got to the question, okay, what is this fractured atlas all about? Why are they getting in the middle of this? And, and who are they, right? And, and that's where, and, and we said, what is the connection between fractured atlas, which is a New York based nonprofit apparently, and Equality Labs, which is a San Francisco or a California based quote unquote nonprofit, right? We don't so far, the implication, although they have, they've been very careful never to actually say that they are a nonprofit. Okay. Interestingly enough, during the California debates that was going on, uh, the founder of Equality Labs was approached by Dia TV. And they asked the question, are you guys a for-profit corporation? She quietly sidestepped the issue and said, we are not getting into that. And we watched that and we were like, wait a minute, if you're a charity, you should be proud to say you're a charity. And if you're not a charity, then you should say you're not a charity, you're, you're moving on, right? So, so, let's, so we said, okay, let's take a look at this whole fractured atlas thing, what's going on there. So if you, if you can go to the next slide, it shows you, and it shows you what I was talking about. This is from Equality Labs' webpage. This is from their homepage. It says building power through community organizing, art, research, and digital security. Now all the dots are connected, right? So the digital security part gets them funding from organizations like San Francisco Foundation, right? The art part is what Fractured Atlas is all about because what they do, and, and we'll, we'll get to that in one second, what they do uh, is to provide cover for people who can't afford to be 501c3s on their own. Right? If you go to Fractured Atlas's homepage, they tell you that their job is to provide what they call fiscal sponsorship. They provide fiscal sponsorship of people who want to raise public money but don't have the infrastructure to become a publicly a designated charity. So Fractured Atlas acts as their fund funder or fund provider or however you want to call it. So, so here is here is the if so this is by clicking on the donate button in Equality Lab. So imagine you are a just an ordinary person, you are particularly impressed by Equality Labs' work and you want to go donate to them. And you go to their website, you click on donate. It doesn't tell you actually that you're going to Fractured Atlas. It's just this donation page still looks like it's an Equality Labs page, which is normal because many organizations do that. They want to keep their branding. And then I, I, cut, a, I cut a piece from the FAQs because these are FAQs that you see on the right-hand side, they don't appear when you are actually donating, right? So when you're donating, all you see is whether it's one time, monthly, $5, $10, $15, other. And if you see the FAQ itself, right? So if you, if you flip to the next page, it shows you 
what exactly this means. Literally, it says it's a fiscally sponsored project of Fractured Atlas 501c3 charity. Contributions for the purpose of Equality Labs are tax deductible to the extent permitted by law. This is what I would call not necessarily the smoking gun, but the key evidence that Equality Labs presents itself publicly as a project of Fractured Atlas, not as an independent entity, not as its own company or not as its own anything, but as a project of another charity, Fractured Atlas. Fractured Atlas, by the way, has a budget of about 25 to $30 million a year, right? They raise a lot of money and they distribute a lot of money. And presumably, they're distributing a lot of money to Quality Labs. So here is the, here is the fun part. What this means, practically speaking, is Equality Labs has the best of both worlds. And I want to be very, very careful in how I state that. It has the best of both worlds because it is able to raise funds from people who want to donate and get a tax deduction, right? Like it was a 501c3. At the same time, it does not have to file any paperwork indicating who runs it, what they make, what they take, what they spend it on, which we all have to do, right? I mean, at Kona, we have to file a document that describes exactly what we took in, exactly what we spent it on, who the board members are, and who's getting paid what. But Equality Labs doesn't have to do that. Why? Because it's a project of Fractured Atlas. Okay, so so I want people, I want that to sink in for a bit with people because it is deliberately, and in my view, as a financial professional, it, it is deliberately creating that veil of being a sponsored, a fiscally sponsored project of a nonprofit and at the same time not having to disclose its funding. Now, the fact that Omedia Network has funded Equality Labs tells us most likely they're continuing to fund Equality Labs, right? But because they are not publicly disclosed, they can fund Equality Labs to whatever extent they want and nobody can ask any questions and if they do, they are not entitled to any information because, drum roll please, Equality Labs is a Delaware corporation. Equality Labs is a Delaware corporation. So if you go to the next slide, we pulled up the records from the state of Delaware. They registered in March of 2022. Does the timing suggest something to you? What was happening in March of 2022? They were planning an assault on caste. They were planning a multiple university-based attack on caste. They were going to make caste front and center. So at that point, it somehow became important for them to register themselves as an organization. Before this, before 321-2022, we have absolutely no information about where Equality Labs was based, who were their funders, who was their, what was their headquarters, nothing. Now at least we know that they are a registered corporation in Delaware, right? The evidence is right in front of us. We know that there's a board of directors in the paperwork. We know that they have to file a certain amount of minimal amount of paperwork each year for tax purposes. Those documents are confidential. They're not publicly available. And because they're registered as an LLC, None but their partners, none but the, the closely, LLCs are very closely held, right? Limited liability corporations. We have no idea who's running it, who owns it, who funds it, nothing. So, so that's where we are at. So we now have this organization. So I think Stanford University needs to pay attention to who they are platforming. They need to think about not just Stanford University, any university or any public entity that wants to look at Equality Labs and what they bring. Look, this is a free country. This is America. This is capitalism. This is where people are allowed to make money. They are required, you know, as long as they follow all the laws. So don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that what Quality Labs is doing in any way, shape, or form illegal or anything like that. That's not for me to say. It's not for me to allege. But 
I think there are enough flags here that are very clearly suggesting that Equality Labs wants to have it both ways. It wants to be able to raise funds from the public as a 501, as though they were a 501c3 without necessarily disclosing to the public blatantly that they are not a 501c3. Now, are they raising enough funds from the public to completely fund themselves? Or are they getting funded by other sources, say, more from the media network? Who knows? Who else? Right? We don't know. And we won't know because they are not a registered 501c3. Right? So Stanford has to ask itself this very fundamental question. What exactly are they selling and what am I buying? Thank you so much. And that actually blows the cover off of some of their claims. If the pitch book said that they are a 501c3 and then they raised funds, they basically lied their way through that whole thing. I'm not a lawyer. Again, yeah. I have to weigh my words carefully. But anyone looking at it a li in a little bit of depth and detail would understand that they have been getting some free money. And I'll give you a contrast. P Gurus is a C corporation, California C corporation. And I have to jump through hoops before they will even look at my pitch deck. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and today, if I have to advertise on you know any of the social media platforms, I am doing cartwheels, literally. Mm -hmm. And 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 yet right. all this is happening in plain sight. Yes, uh, Sudaji, <laughs> Sudaji, I'd like you to weigh in a little bit on this because you tirelessly went in front of so many. Uh, you know, politicians, assemblymen, state senators, trying to tell them why this caste discrimination law, uh, SB 403, was incorrect, that it was already enshrined. I have, I have, I have one doubt in this. And, and Sudhaji, I'll let you answer this question. Then I'll come back and ask it to both of you. Over to Sudhaji. Yeah, I just wanted to also say, um, if you look at the Equality Labs website, they claim to stand for a lot of... Um, uh, faiths and uh, groups, including Adivasis. Tell me who's an Adivasi in the United States. Okay. So I just want to frame it by saying uh, for the audience that's listening, a lot of time, uh, and this is what happened with the lawmakers too, a lot of confusion about this whole concept of caste. First, caste in India is not what caste uh, is being uh, debated in the United States. Caste in India is being used for uh, affirmative action or reservation policies to help uplift the oppressed people. And a lot of people have taken advantage of that. But in the United States, it's not an affirmative action program. Although the intent of this equality labs and cohorts is to bring affirmative action into the United States in very sneaky ways, right? So in the United States, caste is, you cannot say, why are you opposing caste uh, discrimination? Isn't that a good thing? Of course, opposing any discrimination is a good thing. But here, what we are debating is not oppression of any particular person. It is just based on an identity and someone claiming to say, I stand for this. But the, uh, the standing for this, when it comes to policy, it only applies to Hindus but Hindus are not represented on Equality Labs website. So there's a lot of conflict of uh, interest and conflict of ideas here. Why is Equality Labs, uh, whose uh, um, board of directors uh, at one time and maybe even today included Muslims from other countries? How do they stand for a Hindu? Huh? So the, the, I just want to point out and I want everybody to understand caste in India is not what is being debated here. We are debating the um, claim of an Equality Labs kind of an organization to represent all Hindus in the United States, about uh, 4 million or 3 million or whatever it is, and say that we are going to fight for your interest. Nobody has authorized them to fight for our interest. Plus, if we want to fight for our interest, we are perfectly capable of doing it. So I, this is very, very confusing. What happened to the lawmakers was exactly this. They said, isn't caste discrimination uh, a bad thing? Why would I not sign up for it? And also, remember, uh, they told us, they remember, the bill is supported by uh, Assemblyman Ash Kalra, the only Hindu in the legislature. And uh, the second uh, sponsor from the Assembly is Jasmeet uh, Baines, two uh, people of Indian origin. If they support it, how can you tell me not to support? 
right? So complete ignorance on the part of Americans. They only know what they learn. And in some cases, we also found that Hispanic lawmakers said, oh, I know about caste. I've seen it in Mexico. But then we probe and said, Suresh was on the call. And we probed yeah. and said, but have you experienced it in the United States? No, we have not experienced it in the United States. But because it is in Mexico, I think this is a good idea. And the senator on the Judiciary Committee, the Hispanic lady said, I am voting for it. So a conflation of a lot of misunderstood concepts is being piloted. Part of this is because we haven't been very aggressive in, uh, aggressive in having conversations with the lawmakers, which is what we have been doing since all of this started. And it will take a long time to explain and make sure people understand what is the debate. But as long as the United States textbooks called caste equals Hindu, all of the global dictionaries called caste equals Hindu, yeah. all the university academics say, I am an expert. <laughs> they all uh, are so, of different so, religions and say, caste is Hindu. Hey, caste is not me. That is me, a practicing Hindu saying, you take it on and put it on yourself, but don't bring it on me and we are going to fight it. And, Thank and, you so and, much. Thank you, Sudhaji. So, so, you have something to say. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I was scratching my head as to exactly what is the end game for Equality Labs. They are, a pub, they are now, it's very clear, they are a profit making organization. Exactly what are they making profits from? So, my contention is, and again, I'm speaking as a financial professional, as, as somebody who's you know quite familiar with all the accounting stuff. I think what Equality Labs is up to is they are creating a problem and then coming in to solve it. They are creating a problem by saying, hey, there is this whole rampant caste, uh, uh, caste discrimination going on and you have to hire somebody to come and teach you all about it and therefore hire us, right? Let us conduct these webinars. Let us tell you what is going on. The other thing which I also discovered, as you might imagine, as you can imagine from some of these numbers, that information that we dug up is meant to be hidden. It is designed to be buried because the San Francisco Foundation, this is just, and mind you, this is just one charitable organization, SFF, right? The SFF's filing is 825 pages long. And the fractured atlas entry is one entry out of those 825 pages. Imagine how long, and, and the IRS doesn't keep it as PDF files. The IRS keeps it as, as uh, images. So you have to pull the image out, convert it to a PDF, do the search, and Equality Labs as a name doesn't appear anywhere. So you have no idea that this is going on. So just unraveling these corporate veils, the various uh, screens that they put in front of you, it's an impossible task. Uh, so organizations like Equality Labs, I think, are just counting on that. They're counting on the complexity they are counting on the fact that nobody is going to have the patience or the energy to actually go through and figure this out. And they are just carrying on along blithely as though it doesn't matter. I think it matters to people who write checks to Equality Labs to understand that they are writing checks to a for-profit corporation and simultaneously they're getting a tax break. Uh, there's a very interesting side note about Creative Catalyst, if I can, if I can go into that for one second. If, as, I, as I pointed out, in 2018, they got $124,000 from, uh, from uh, SFF. There's a rule in IRS that says, if you are a charitable organization with revenues of more than $50,000, you have to file what is called a 990 easy or a 990. If you don't have revenues above $50,000, you can put it in a postcard. They call it form 990M. Creative catalysts for the entire existence have always filed nothing but 990Ms, the postcards. They have not once acknowledged the fact that they have received $124,000 from SFF. So either the SFF is mistaken or Creative Catalyst is BSing the IRS. But that's a matter between Creative Catalyst and IRS. I'm, I don't want to get into that. The only reason I'm interested in it is because Equality Labs is supposedly a project of Creative Catalyst. So why did they not report the fact that they got $124,000 from SFF that SFF says they paid them? Now, um, I just want to uh, ask Stanford this question, and, and both of you feel free to weigh in. Uh, recently, a certain individual who is a former president of 
Indian National Congress came visiting and they made it out as if he was addressing students in Stanford. Nothing could be farther from the truth. There was a building in the Stanford campus which is available on rent. Somebody paid the rent for two, three hours. And it was in that place that the actual conversation took place. And, and the whole thing was painted as if it was Stanford uh, uh, lecture. I'm hoping that Stanford will come clean with this February 6th webinar, whether this is being done with the blessings of Stanford, with their logo on it, that they approve of it, or is it something that is happening in their campus that somebody is trying to pawn off as being a Stanford-sponsored event? Uh, any ideas on this? Uh, I'll go first with uh, uh, you, Suresh, and then Sudhaji. Well, we saw this during the DGH conference, right? Uh, during the Dismantling Global Hindutva Conference, where the conference said, oh, these following universities are sponsoring the DGH conference. And then when we publicized it, they were backing off like crazy. Harvard said, no, 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 we, are, we don't have anything to do with it. Princeton said, no, 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 we don't have anything to do with it. So yeah, this is not new. This is old, old stuff. I mean, this is what they do. This is how they kind of project themselves to be bigger than they are. Whether this is actually a official program of Stanford or not, only Stanford can say, but I would caution Stanford that they should take heed to what happened in Harvard. They should take heed in what happened at UPenn, where certain departments, certain individuals, when they go unchecked, can grind the reputation of even absolutely fantastic top-notch schools into the ground. Now, I'm a, I'm a graduate of the Indian Institute of Technology, and Stanford was the holy grail for us, right, to get to, to, to go to school. And to think that today we would look at Stanford and say, really, these guys, what do they have to, what do they, what does Stanford have anything at all to do with caste? They are, I thought, they were a technology, law, uh, business school, those kind of places. When did they become these caste warriors? And so my cautionary note would be to say, look very, very closely at what kind of campus environment you're creating for your students, because Stanford's reputation is inextricably tied with the quality of the students that come there. And for them to risk it over some organization that is pretending to be a nonprofit because they want to kind of check a box for DEI. I mean, recently they had the judge who showed up at Stanford and who was treated so badly that Stanford had to actually apologize and fire the person who was in charge of DEI. So soon after that, why would Stanford get into another such event is my basic question to them. <coughs> Daji, any, any bird come and whisper in your ear if it is actually a sponsored event of Stanford or is it just a <coughs> private event being passed off as a Stanford event? Well, remember, it's a... Uh... Uh, at the, uh, it's sponsored by the South Asian Center. And we know the South Asian uh, studies groups in almost all the universities have um, <laughs> their uh, quota yeah. of uh, socialist uh, uh, people. And a lot of them are of Indian origin, right? Um, and so the social justice um, <laughs> issue, uh, which brought uh, the downfall of the presidents of these Harvard and UPenn and all that, uh, looks like uh, Stanford is headed that same way unless they start to look at really what's happening. I would also say, you know, just like Raji Malhotraji in his Snakes in the Ganga called out the donors of uh, major universities, we need to look at who are the donors at uh, Stanford and uh, have them challenge uh, the what's happening in this particular area of social justice and the fact that the Jewish students and the Hindu students have to go become incognito have to uh, walk around and do uh, mind their own business, not ever publicizing their uh, belief system, which is not true for others. That creates a highly discriminatory environment on the campus. Regarding uh, sponsoring uh, foreign um, leaders, etc., they have to be very careful who they're doing, right? Even Sh Senator Wahab, who sponsored SP 403, stood and met with um, personalities from India who have a terrible reputation of thrashing India. So I think uh, we just need to bring this to the attention of uh, Stanford, and I think a lot of the Hindu organizations are going to write to them. Although, unfortunately, we don't have a student population. We have a lot of Indian students at uh, Stanford, Hindu students. But I would say they're not as coordinated and um, 
you know, well uh, organized as somebody else. So they are always uh, on the, uh, you know, uh, they uh, they don't have a voice. And so here, Suresh, me, you, we are giving voice to these students, <laughs> voice to the real Dalit Bahujan, uh, because they don't have it. Thank you so much, uh, Sudhaji. Thank you so much, Sureshji, for this uh, excellent uh, conversation we had today. So the ball is in your court, Stanford. It's up to you to decide. And we will leave it at that. And viewers, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget to click on the bell button for notifications. Thanks once again, gentlemen. Thanks once again, Sudhaji. And Namaskar. Namaskar. Jai Namaskaram,